As a new decade dawned, the future looked bright. If life were a movie, it might look like this. Yes! Instead, life threw us a curveball. And in 2020, the movie of our lives looked more like this. It's bad. And this. It's a little on the dark side, but you know, that's cool. But a funny thing happened on the way to the apocalypse. Theaters closed, but films refused to die. People rediscovered old ways to watch them. And new ways. I hope quarantine never ends. He's lying. It's one of those infinite time loop situations you might have heard about. Meanwhile, the Toronto Film Critics Association found its own way to adapt. What is it the writer says? Tell the story you know. There are lots of ugly things about our history. But I think we have to know them. I think we have to learn them. We all know what it's like to be told that there is not a place for you to be featured. You're looking for someone who exists like you so you're not alone. This is what revolution looks like, real revolution. And you are different. You're different. It's wonderful. That's the real magic of the movies. As live as possible from the Paradise Theatre in Toronto, it's the 24th Toronto Film Critics Association Awards, honoring the best of the best in a year where movies could not be stopped. And now, one of our co-hosts for the evening, renowned culture commentator and senior editor of Refinery29's Unbothered, Kathleen newman Brimang. For the next hour, we'll pay tribute to superior cinema, incredible indies, and the best of Hollywood and Hollywood North. Capped by this country's biggest film award, the $100,000 Rogers Best Canadian Film Prize. And now, please meet my co-host, the queen of the red carpet, the co-host of eTalk and The Social, and the founder of LaineyGossip.com, Lainey Louie. Thanks, Kathleen, and hello, film fans everywhere. Welcome to the Toronto Film Critics Association Awards. You know, Kathleen, in a normal year, we would have had a few drinks already, and we'd be gossiping in the corner, and we'd have more drinks, but that is not to be. We have to remain separated. But hey, the bonus is, we are the cutest ones in this place. That is a fact. At least we are feeling ourselves. We gotta take the small joys where we can get them, because this year has been different. Different with a dire downside. But the shakeup also forced us to take a hard look at society and ourselves. Repressed racial tensions and generations of injustice played out on the streets and in our consciousness. And on screen, we saw a crop of powerful, diverse stories. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Judas and the Black Messiah, One Night in Miami, Minari, and a Chinese-born filmmaker, Chloe Jaw, whose take on the fractured American dream, Nomadland, is our best picture tonight. None of this happened by magic. The talent that burned so brightly this year began in the dark until they were seen and championed by people who love movies. Lenny, you and I love movies, but sometimes the movies we love are not recognized by the TFCA. Yeah, like rom-coms. What's your problem, TFCAs, with rom-coms? To all the boys I've loved before, deserves. Always and forever, the wedding planner. There's so many classics, Notting Hill, Crazy Rich Asians, uh, Save the Last Dance. Okay, Save the Last Dance is not a rom-com. Who says? 
says me. It is not a rom-com. Okay, I, this is going to be a fight that lasts forever. So let's say we agree to disagree on that, but we agree always on Notting Hill. Notting Hill's a classic. Obviously, we are not cynics because we love corny romances. People often confuse criticism with cynicism, but true film critics actually love movies, and they'd be thrilled to live in a world of nothing but great cinema, so they search it out. TFCA members have a history of supporting Canadian filmmakers, LGBTQ filmmakers, and filmmakers of color, as well as niche film festivals with provocative themes. And with their lead sponsor, Rogers, they reward the best of Canada every year with the country's largest film prize, $100,000 to the winner and $5,000 each to the runners-up. And the TFCA takes its responsibility to heart to continue to introduce and amplify our most talented voices to the world. So I know they won't mind us saying, Kathleen, that the TFCA themselves need to do some work in their membership to better represent the audiences and communities they serve. So now, let's honor the best U.S. and international films. But stay tuned for the last act, because that one is all about us, Canada's creative talent and the people who love them. Before we go any further, we want to acknowledge that we are located on the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat Nations. We acknowledge the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, a treaty whose spirit is based in collective stewardship and sharing of land and resources, and one which extends to all nations living in present-day Toronto. This year taught us anything, it's the importance of community, and film critics are an important part of the film community. Okay, some of you might picture critics as basement-dwelling, angry people who spend a lot of time in the dark. And while that's not entirely wrong, critics are really crucial as a link from filmmakers to audiences. Yeah, sure, some big-budget films, the studio action adventure movies, the comic book franchises spend so much money on marketing, they're almost critic-proof. But why was Tenet so long? And seriously, can someone explain it to me after we're done here? And me too, please, because I fell asleep. But when a film is personal or daring or in danger of getting lost in a world crowded with content, it's the critics who shine a light, who urge audiences to see what the screenwriters, directors, actors, and crews work so hard to make. Critics are also incredibly humble and do not take our jobs too seriously. The Toronto Film Critics hand out film awards in 12 categories. We're going to save the big prize, the Rogers Best Canadian Film Award, for last, because movies are all about suspense. As for the other 11 categories, well, it's kind of a miracle when two critics agree on anything, much less an entire organization. So who better to present the next awards than the critics themselves? They're thirsty for the spotlight, too. Hey, Anne. Hey, Jim. Now, of course, every year when we talk about supporting actors, uh, people, people get incensed sometimes because, uh, you know, a supporting performance can be Judy Dench uh, measured in seconds in, uh, <laughs> in Shakespeare in Love. This is quite the opposite. It's, it's, it's almost 50-50, really. I mean, the character is, is in the title, you know, Judas and the Black Messiah, that, that being Kalu Kaluuya's character. You know, so at, at best it's almost 50-50 or 60-40. I know, when I think back of the film, you know, just like that, Daniel comes to mind. His portrayal was just so balanced between the vulnerability that he had and the doubts and the incredible bravery. You want to say strength, but it's so much more than that. He, that booming voice of his delivering um, stirring speeches, you know, it, it, it made him a threat to the racist uh, status I, quo. I like that. It was, it was very subtle because he, he was kind of riffing the character. Yeah. He, he was young and, that, and there was a subtlety to that that, that I really appreciated. The speeches that, that uh, Daniel gave were informed by his work with an opera coach. So I found that fascinating, the, the, the cadence and the, and the tenor and the, the resonance of it. It's a great performance. So congratulations to Daniel Kaluuya, our pick for Best Supporting Actor for Judas and the Black Messiah. Hello, Toronto Film Critics Association. Thank you so much for the honor and, uh, and the recognition. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I share this with um, director Shaka King, uh, Ryan and Zinzi Kugler, Sev and everyone at Proximity, Charles King, everyone at Macro, Warner Brothers, and amazing cast, Lakeith, Dominique Fishback, um, 
and all the cast, all incredible cast, every single person, um, all the crew in Cleveland. You know, we really, it takes a village to build a film. So, and share this with Chairman Fred Jr. and uh, Mama Kua. Thank you for shedding light and truth to, to this. And, um, and this, and thank you again, Toronto Film Critics Association for bringing more light to Chairman Fred's story and Chairman Fred's legacy. Thank you so much. Up next, our pick for Best Supporting Actress. Hi, Chris. Hey, Peter. And we're here to talk about the Best Supporting Actress winner, Maria Bakalova. So we, somebody said a year ago that we'd be talking about somebody who, other than Sasha Baron Cohen for a Sasha Baron Cohen film. I think we would have trouble believing that. But Maria Bakalova, you know, our pick for Best Supporting Actress, she really does convince people that she's the big draw for this movie, don't you think? Yeah, he's found a co-star who can uh, take as good as, as he can and puts herself in some literally dangerous positions sometimes in the name of comedy. I'm reminded of, of other comedians like someone like Carol Burnett, say, who would take a, a character and just commit and go deep into that character and not come out of it until, until it was done. And I was thinking Lucille Ball. And, and the essential ingredient here is fearlessness, right? You have to be totally fearless totally willing to go for the laugh, and, and does she ever? Yeah, that is the watchword, and I think she, she uh, certainly earns our, uh, our award and our congratulations for it. And I'm looking forward to seeing her again. I can hardly wait to see her next film. Congratulations to Maria Bakalova, our pick for Best Supporting Actress. Thank you so very much for voting for me, Toronto Film Critic Association. This award is really special to me because three years ago, I received my first ever acting award in Toronto. I'm so proud of this recognition and strongly believe that it proves that we are living in a world without boundaries such as nationality or barriers like having an accent, where we celebrate who we are, where we come from and what we stand for, where every little kid dream is valid, no matter how grand. It also means that now we can start having these important conversations about representation on screen for actors from all parts of the world. My unbelievable Borat journey, thanks to the amazing Sasha Baron Cohen, my Borat family, Jennifer Salke and Amazon Studios, has shown me just how much this breakthrough means to people from Bulgaria and Eastern Europe and how inspired they have been for their own dreams. Thank you. Up next, our pick for best documentary. Hey Rad. Hey Mark. And Rad, this has been a great year for documentary. Our category has four nominees as opposed to three, so that, that's an indication of that, right? Absolutely. A couple of really interesting ones, Crip Camp and Spike Lee's uh, wonderful work with David Byrne, American Utopia. They didn't even get to the top two. When we get to the top two, we're talking about a couple of extraordinary docs, but different. Well, I mean, it's interesting because yeah, those top two films, uh, or when we say top two, like these are the uh, films that we were really debating at the TFCA Awards, uh, Collective and Time, Collective about Romanian journalists going after a really corrupt government, uh, and it was a very extraordinary story. This is more journeyman filmmaking in service of a really remarkable story about people fighting back against the government, whereas Time is really incredible filmmaking teasing out a story that's not extraordinary. It's too, far too commonplace uh, where, where a black family has to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for a family member to come home. Uh, in Time, it's, it, they follow Fox Rich and her family over decades as they wait for, their, for the father, the patriarch of the family, to return home from an inhumane 60-year prison sentence. Uh, that's what stood up to me but Collective is also outstanding. It is, it is outstanding, and I've got to say, heartbreaking, Rad, that you have to say that this story isn't extraordinary. Mm -hmm. That so many black American families, diverse families, have ended up part of this corrupt American penal system. In the case of Collectif, of course, what we've got is, is this story of journalists, as you say, sports journalists of all people, breaking the big story, uh, toppling one government, uh, talking about the healthcare system, and that's something that's so important to all of us, not just in Romania, but throughout the world. Something has to be said about the fact that this is uh, touching a lot of people during the year of a pandemic where we're looking at corrupt healthcare systems. Like, we're, we're journalists, we feel that connection, and I, I mean, I think, the, you know, it's not all that surprising that a group of film critics gravitated towards a story about people in media, um, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. Y you're right. I'm, I, I think we voted, we voted for one of our own. Well, and that's why Collective is the Toronto Film Critics Association's pick for Best Documentary.
Hello everybody, I'm uh, Alexander Nanau, the director of Collective and I would like to thank you in the name of our whole team for awarding Collective with the Best Documentary Award. It is a joy and honor to be recognized by the Toronto Film Critics Association. Thank you. Up next, we have our pick for Best First Feature. I'm Jenny. I'm Johanna, and our category is Best First Feature. Yay! I love this category. Me too. Um, every year you get some really lived in, passionate things, and not coincidentally, uh, very often this category is dominated by women directors because we're still in the era where women directors are getting their first shot. But I do think that the people who are, we've named in our category this year, Emerald Fennell and Rada Blank, are filmmakers that we're going to see more of in the future. I think they will get to their second feature. I'm really excited that this year our pick was Rada Blank, 40-year-old uh, version. This film I nominated for pretty much every category I could. So you invented uh, categories I'm, to I'm nominate. I'm really happy this. about this. But one of the things I wanted to mention was the use of black and white, which obviously brings to mind uh, the early films of Spike Lee. But I think the world that she creates is, is really her own. One of the things that I most enjoyed was going into the world of independent hip hop, into the home studio, into the boxing ring to see the rap battles. She's herself you know the movies about being 40 and she embraces all the pros and cons all the stuff she knows and she doesn't know and she brings all that to the film and that's why it's so exciting for us to be able to give best first feature to Rada Blank so here's Rada hi I'm Rada Blank the writer director and producer of the 40 year old version and I'm here to say thank you so much to the Toronto Film Critics Association for awarding me the honor of best first feature. It was in March of last year that I first spent time in Toronto. I was invited by Cameron Bailey and the wonderful folks at TIFF to do a small workshop with some new filmmakers there. And it was such a good time and I received such a warm reception that I couldn't help but fall in love with Toronto. I just wanted to spend more time there. Little did I know that it would be the last place outside of the US that I'd visit because a vicious pandemic was about to impact the entire country, the entire world in ways we could never predict. And it would cause many people in my position to question their role as storyteller. What purpose does it serve when the country and more personally, my people are so affected by this pandemic? What I learned was that story, TV, films would be a needed respite in a very turbulent time. Films would not only create an escape for me and many others, but it would reinvig reinvigorate me in my role in making stories, especially ones that might cause someone to look at themselves and maybe even dust off an old passion or heal from loss. So I'm very thrilled to receive this honor of Best First Film from the Toronto Films Critics Association, especially at this time in my life. Though I've been writing for quite some time, I'm very new to filmmaking, and this is one hell of a way to begin a career. I'd like to thank my family at Netflix, my producers at Hillman Grad, my financiers at New Slate Pick Ventures, the cast and crew for helping me to make this film, and thank you to all the critics who helped to advocate, celebrate, and lift my first film. Thank you so much. Next up is our pick for animated feature. Hi, Tom. Hello, Anne. Well, Wolf Walkers, who would have thought in this day and age we'd have an animated family film about 16th century Ireland, witches, wolves, mysticism, Puritans, Druids, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. It's wonderful. To me, it looks, it's so gorgeously made and, and illustrated. It looks like living tapestries. There's also the animation was just so captivating because mm. it's, it is so almost a throwback kind of animation that it feels unique again. But I love the fact that it's a, it's a very young female protagonist who, who does stand up to, to her father, to, to the legal powers that be, to go after who she knows she must be. I was so happy to be able to show it to my family, mm. particularly my daughter, to see uh, women and young girls in this kind of role where they oppose everything that they're told for what they know is right. To me, it's the most wonderful aberration almost of a film that's out in, in 2020. 
So congratulations to directors Tom Moore and Ross Stewart for our pick for best animated feature film, Wolfwalkers. Hi, my name is Ross Stewart. I'm uh, one of the directors of Wolfwalkers, and I just want to say a huge thank you to Toronto Film Critics for awarding uh, Wolfwalkers Best Animated Feature. Um, it's, it's, it means a whole lot to us and the whole crew, especially seeing as Toronto was where we had our, our premiere. And, um, you know, it's really great to get recognition across the Atlantic for, for our, our little humble film. So um, thank you very much. I'm Tom Moore. I'm the other director of Wolfwalkers. And again, yeah, on behalf of all our crew, it means so much to be recognised by the Toronto Film Critics Association. And this award means a lot to us. We have long-standing connections between our studio, Cartoon Saloon, and various studios in Canada. And we have plenty of Canadians working with us. So it means a lot to us to be recognised by our, our friends and, um, in the North. So thank you so much to the home of the Maple Leaf. Appreciate it. Thank you, Toronto. We'll be there as soon as this pandemic is over to celebrate. <laughs> and up next, our pick for the best international film. Hey, Kate. Hi, Mark. So is this fun for us to be talking about the best international film, a category that both, both of us like a lot because we're readers and we like to read subtitles. Yes, and this was a particularly strong year for subtitled films. Uh, one that got a very lively debate going um, amongst the critics was another round with Mads Milkinson playing a school teacher who lays a bet with his friends that he should keep a certain blood uh, alcohol content at all times. And then Beanpole, a Russian film set in uh, Leningrad in 1945. Two young women whose lives have just been devastated by the war are trying to rebuild things. It was really an amazing film. Extraordinary. And yet these are the runners up. The winner for us, of course, was Baccarat, a Brazilian film that starts off people in a village trying to adjust to their lives. And then about 45 minutes into the film, something changes. This is an amazing genre bending feat. We find out the villagers are under attack by a group of American tourists who are, have come big game hunting and basically their game are these villagers. And the villagers fight back. It's a thriller, but there's elements of sci-fi, there's elements of horror, especially at the end, and the way in which those are played for great metaphoric power, the political metaphor I found very strong. I enjoyed the John Carpenter references, a little bit of music that sounded like Carpenter, and a school, which is the John Carpenter School. Congratulations to our pick for Best International Film, Baccarat. Hello everyone in Toronto. My name is Cleva Mendonça Filho. I have written and directed uh, Bacurau with my very good friend Julian Gornelis. I'm very happy to accept the award for Best International Feature from the Toronto Film Critics Association. I have been to Toronto a few times. I screened Aquarius and Bacurau at the festival. Uh, I noticed uh, this amazing, very strong uh, atmosphere of cinephilia in and around the festival. And I have to say that uh, as an outside observer and as a cinephile, uh, every time I think about Toronto and cinema, I also think about uh, Mr. David Cronenberg. And I'd like to dedicate this award to Mr. David Cronenberg who has, I think, shown me that being extreme can go very well with compassion. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I also hope uh, we are back into cinemas very soon. I need my fix of film going very badly. So uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much for this honor and uh, hope to see you all soon. Ambulances, they never stop here in Brazil. Goodbye, ciao. Next up is our pick for best actor. Hey Eli. Hey Tom, so let's talk about our pick for best actor 
so well deserved the remarkable performance of Riz Ahmed in Sound of Metal. You're absolutely right. It, it is a role that asks for a lot of things and he delivers on all levels. And it could be a role that is easily criticized because he also has to show some deficiencies mm -hmm. that he doesn't have in real life, but he sort of is able to uh, rise ab above that and deliver a role that is empathetic, but strong and never, never condescending to anyone, regardless of, of, uh, of what he's portraying at that moment. No, I think, I mean, almost the reverse, that empathy is the key. I mean, the way that he connected with the deaf actors and he's talked about being embraced by that community. To imagine immersing yourself and not only learning sign language, but learning how to act in sign language, right? I mean, and then throwing yourself into the drumming. He's talked about this being one of the highlights of his career. And I, I get the sense that it was that challenge that really stimulated him. And I do think that he's the kind of actor who's gonna find a way to even top this in the future. So that is our pick for best actor, the wonderful performance of Riz Ahmed in Sound of Metal. Thank you so much to the TFCA for this incredible honor. Uh, thank you in particular to Peter Howell, the chair of the Toronto Film Critics Association. I'd like to share this award with our incredible writer-director, Darius Marder, for his bravery, the uniqueness of his vision, and his determination in getting this film made over 13 years. Um, I'd like to thank our producers, Bert and Sasha Caviar, Jen Salky, and all the team at Amazon, our crew for getting us over the line every day. This film was made in a very Low budget, short space of time, but made with a lot of love and a lot of um, uh, blood and sweat from all of our crew. And uh, most of all, I'd like to thank um, the rest of the cast, Paul Racy, Olivia Cook, Domenico Toledo, who's all grown up now, Shaheem, Chelsea Lee, um, Lauren Ridloff, Jeremy Lee Stone, um, and in particular, Jeremy Lee Stone, my sign instructor for teaching me the true meaning of communication, the true meaning of listening. And uh, I'd like to dedicate this award to all my mentors within the deaf community. Thank you very much. Up next, our pick for Best Actress. Hello, Rad. Hey, Joanna. We're here to do Best Actress. I think, honestly, we could have gone with any one of these actresses this year. We're talking about Sydney Flanagan from Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, Frances McDormand from Nomadland, but I was leaning towards Viola. Um, not just because it's an incredible performance she gives as Ma Rainey in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, but because, I mean, I just feel like she brings a certain story to that performance. Yeah, I completely hear you. I, I feel the same way, actually, about Frances McDormand's performance in Nomadland. I feel like this is a movie based on a non-fiction book, which we don't see very often. And they chose a lot of the people from that book, real life nomads, to play versions of themselves in the film. So you would think swooping in this Hollywood Oscar winning actress would really throw the balance off, but it's because of Frances McDormand's delicacy, I think, that she's able to meet those, those real life people at their level. And a lot of that, I think, is because Frances McDormand is such a good listener in this movie. She's letting those people shine. Um, she's doing a lot of things that maybe some actresses would draw the line at. I know you have a favorite scene. <laughs> she shits in a bucket, She shits in a bucket. <laughs> Not a lot of big Hollywood actresses are gonna do that, but it really sets the tone for what she's willing to do, what she's willing to bring to this movie. And I think when you're doing a picture like this, what you want is for it to feel real, but what she adds is a layer that makes it also feel true. And I think that that's really important. And that's why our pick for Best Actress is Frances McDormand in Nomadland. Up next is our pick for Best Screenplay. Hi, Eli. Hey, Kate. I always think of this as a really tricky category because mm -hmm. I think you have to be almost inside a production to know where screenplay stops and direction picks up. And we had a we had a very lively debate raucous, in our meetings. Raucous debate, raucous yeah. debate about Nomadland because some of it is improvised and is that the screenplay or not. But what's so exciting about Minari and I think what makes it so appropriate is that in some ways it is kind of that classic 
American story. And, and you have to give the credit to the screenplay and the way the director and writer, Lee Isaac Chung, has taken this like man versus nature, this guy in the field trying to get his vegetable farm going. And it feels like a slice of Americana. It feels like that version of the American dream. But the way he does it by reframing it inside the Korean immigrant experience gives a perspective on this that that we've never seen before and yet that that the credit is due to the story it was his choice to tell that story that way yeah it's a, it's a sort of universal archetypal story and yet amazing detail in it yes. amazing specificity one thing that really strikes me about the story is the way the little boy has this heart condition and so the parents are always anxious about him and it really defines his relationship with his parents and the, the child parent dynamic in the family generally and I thought that was a beautiful example of, of something that's that's a very fine detail that is screenplay well, I love what happens and I want I don't want to spoil too much but the evolution of the relationship between the grandmother and the boy. I mean, that, that is writing, right? Those are choices, that is drama, that is heart, just amazing stuff. Congratulations to our pick for best screenplay, Minari. Thank you, Toronto Film Critics Association, for this uh, incredible honor and award. Um, I, I was so surprised when I heard the news. Um, I this was a hard script to write. I, I worked on it in the dark. I didn't know if it would ever get made. Um, I really just stuck at it because uh, it was so personal to me. And so something like this is incredibly um, gratifying and humbling um, just to know that you all connected to this personal story. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so many great films this year and, and just just really thankful that, that you guys uh, uh, wanted to honor this one and, and recognize this one. Um, hope our paths will meet someday. I, I wish I could have been up there in Toronto with you all uh, to, to greet you and give you this message in person. But um, hopefully in LA or Toronto someday, uh, we'll meet up. Thank you again. Up next, our pick for best director. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Chris. I'm excited to be here to talk about our pick for Best Director, which is uh, Chloe Zhao, the director of Nomadland. You interviewed Chloe, is that right? Yeah, I was lucky enough to talk to her when the film was at the Toronto Festival, and uh, she had some really interesting things to say about working with Frances McDormand, who of course is the star of the film. And Chloe also talked about the fact that there are a lot of non-professional actors in this film, and I asked her, how do you work with people who aren't really part of that Hollywood world and she said you just sit down with them and tell them you've got a story worth hearing and then you just listen to them and they'll open right up to you she said. Just the intimacy of the film um, uh, following that story that really is about something that's that's happening in America now but seeing it against this really epic landscape. She did say that even like months after the shoot was done all the people who worked on the film would get a little antsy around four o'clock every day because they knew that was magic hour when the sunlight is just perfect because you look at this film and it is so beautifully shot start to finish uh, and sometimes it's a very tiny part of the day where you can get just that perfect perfect light that she captures so well. She's on a Marvel film isn't she's, she? She's gone to do Eternals now which is opening later this year and that'll be quite a change of pace for her so I think it'll be fascinating to see what Chloe does with that much bigger canvas but we're celebrating Nomadland right now and, and her turn as best director. Thank you Toronto Film Critics Association for the best director award. Um, I'd like to share this with my entire team both um, my production team and also my post-production team. Everyone on this film has been so passionate about uh, what they can contribute. I, I had such a privilege working with everyone. I think a big part of it, looking back, is that we all really felt like this could be our story as well. Um, whether it's someone we know or someone we've experienced in our own life, this, this sense of surviving something um, tragic or feeling like I'm a survivor of a shipwreck and looking at someone else who's been through something similar. 
who has been through uh, grief and loss and also the process of healing and feeling like we could sit around a campfire and share a story. We, we are not only connected with the nomads this way, I think all the, all the crew and all the, all the team who, is be, who are behind the film felt the same way as well. We really are connected each other, to each other as people. And uh, I think uh, uh, that shared passion really made this film possible. So I would like to share this award with them and uh, thank you very much. Next up, we'll have our pick for best picture. Hey Jim. Hey Peter. We're here talking about the year's best picture and for our estimation, Nomadland. Jim, you were telling me about the, how this brought back memories of you growing up in Northern Ontario. You know, I, I drove a forklift for, for a while in Thunder Bay and the money I made there helped send me to Toronto and pay rent and pay tuition. And it occurred to me that Canada and, and the US are basically held together or have been by towns and villages that had a factory, a mill, a silo. There was a reason you were there. And in, in Nomadland, uh, it starts out with that crater when a gypsum mill closes. And Frances McDormand's character loses her zip code. Like if, if, if there was ever a more poetic expression of, of having your existence erased with a, with a bureaucratic keystroke. You know, it's funny how much I love this movie because it basically dashes one of my dreams, which is to get an Airstream trailer and a banjo and a hound dog and just hit the road and kind of live my life that way. But what Chloe Zhao does that really impressed me was she doesn't try to romanticize this. She doesn't try to make it look like you meet the most wonderful people and amazing adventures happen. You meet human beings. You meet people who are eccentric, uh, people who are having trouble, people who aren't, but you really get to meet genuine people. So it's just almost like having a documentary within a narrative film which uh, just works so well. It, it really speaks to the sort of endurance of, uh, of, uh, of community in probably the, the most improbable feel-good movie of the year. Yes, absolutely. You, you can't normally say that about this kind of movie, but I think in this case for sure we're in agreement. It is, it is genuinely a feel-good kind of movie. Congratulations to Chloe Zhao and her team for our pick for best film of 2020, Nomadland. Wow, thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you for the Best Picture Award. I really I don't have much to say, except I'd like to share this with all the nomads that we met along the way. Uh, not only those who share their stories on screen, but also off screen. Uh, we spent a lot of time just hanging out, waiting for the sun to set. So thank you for sharing your stories and you know your adventures, your struggles, your heartbreaks, and also your deep sense of dignity. Um, that taught me so much, the, the, our capacity to persevere in the face of unimaginable tragedy. Um, so much wisdom, so much great memories that we all get to take with us um, when we said to each other, see you down the road. <laughs> So I'd like to share this with them, and I thank you again, and I hope I see you all down the road. Congratulations to all of our winners and nominees for this year. It's turned out to be a great year after all. The Toronto Film Critics Association was founded in 1997. For 24 years, it has handed out annual film awards, and its ever-evolving membership has continued to write about film, creating a dialogue with filmmakers and moviegoers in a city that loves going to the movies. TFCA alumni sat down with each other to find out a little more about their varied filmmaking journeys and the films that inspired them. Albert, can I ask you the first question? You want to ask me the first question? Sure. Like, and then I don't want to be the first one to answer the question. Right. Right. <laughs> what was the biggest misconception you had about filmmaking before you made your first film? That it was easy. That I thought it would feel more narcissistic, but it actually, at best, really feels like being a part of something. My biggest misconception was that um, I'd be good at it. What's one question about your work you wish people would stop asking? If there's always a guy in the audience who asks technical questions, like, what did, what did you shoot this film on? <laughs> it makes you wonder, like, why did you make this film if all they care about is what camera, what camera you shot it on? You get to change one thing in the industry with the snap of a finger. What is it? I think I would take out money. I wish, if, you know, if we had no money involved in filmmaking, we're just all doing it. Um, for the love of it, it would be a, a, a very different space, but I think that's 
something we'd have to change about the entire world, so. I, I had the exact same answer for those. So. I specifically remember on my very first film, after calling cut, I like, came out from behind like at the camera and everyone to go talk to the actors. And I remember the first AD was like, you know, you can just shout to people tell, and I was just like, I need to like go whisper to the person, like, please let me whisper to people. Name one guilty pleasure film. I don't feel guilty about any films, but I am watching The Bachelor with a few of my close friends right now, and that's pretty disgusting. I say my guilty pleasure is Harry Potter. Well, I have lots of them, but the one that I go to is the movie that set me on my path when I was a little boy, and, and it's this Jean-Claude Van Damme martial arts movie called Bloodsport. Yes, <laughs> I love that movie. Who's one person you couldn't work without? Definitely my producer, Tamar Bird. Um, she's been with me for all of my projects and really keeps me level-headed and protected when I'm doing my art. What's been the biggest hurdle to get your films made? The, the industry and, and myself. Um, as an Indigenous woman, I didn't really think that filmmaking was even a possibility for me. However, things have changed massively since I first started. And I think when we made The Body Remembers, uh, it was made at a time when suddenly there were these massive changes within the industry, um, wherein Indigenous filmmakers were finally being given the resources we needed to make our films, feature films. When did you realize that you're a filmmaker? Well, I'm still trying to convince my family that that's what I am right now to this day. I don't think I really realized I was a filmmaker until like shooting the first shot of my first feature and just feeling what that felt like. And, you know, knowing that this is exactly where I want to be um, and that, that I could do it. You know, like that feeling being like, oh, I can actually do this. Why do we keep going back to a critic no matter what film she's reviewing? because we like her voice. Voice is one of those magical undefinables, combining background, observation, point of view. You can't explain it, but you know when you hear it. The TFCA is made up of 35 distinct voices. It's also an advocacy group concerned with the health of the critical industry. So in 2018, they created the TFCA Emerging Critic Award, an annual fellowship to identify, cultivate, and encourage promising new voices, especially underrepresented voices, by offering both a spotlight and financial and career support as they establish themselves in the critical field. The winners are not TFCA members yet, but we hope one day they may be. This year, the TFCA voted on the widest field of candidates yet. So wide, in fact, that they couldn't narrow it down to just one winner. So I'm pleased to introduce this year's two emerging critics, Mark Hansen and Rose Ho. Rose Ho studied art criticism at OCAD University and then discovered her love for film criticism instead. Since then, she has been writing reviews on her personal blog, Rose Colored Ray-Bans. Mark Hansen is a film writer and curator from Toronto with words appearing in Slant Magazine, In the Seats, and Film Trap. He is also the product manager at Bay Street Video, one of North America's last remaining video stores. Congratulations, both of you. I'm grateful to receive the Toronto Film Critics Association's Emerging Critic Award. This recognition means a lot to me after spending many quiet years writing about movies in my little corner of the internet. I am honored by the encouragement of such an esteemed and established group of Canadian film critics, and I look forward to joining this community of movie lovers and hopefully meeting you all in person in the future. A big thank you to the TFCA for this award. It's truly an honor to receive this and be named an emerging critic at a time when there's so many important film critics out there writing about film. Uh, as a kid going to the video store, I always dreamed about working with film, so this is an awesome validation of that. Uh, and lastly, I'd just like to thank my partner, Ashley Manu, for always encouraging me to pursue what I love. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Rose and Mark. Since its inception, the Toronto Film Critics Association has used its awards to spotlight individuals in the Canadian film industry. In that spirit, the TFCA created two awards to honor people who have made notable contributions to the field of movie making, both lifelong film educators and up and coming talent. Appropriately, both are named in honor of critics, the Clyde Gilmore Award and the J. Scott Prize. The late J. Scott was a trailblazing Globe and Mail critic. The award named for him recognizes an emerging talent in Canadian film. This year's J. Scott Prize winner is Kelly Fife Marshall. Kelly is a Toronto-based director, screenwriter, producer, storyteller, speaker, social activist, and humanitarian. 
She's worked in multiple genres, from directing music videos to documentaries and narrative work, including several award-winning short films. 2021 is off to a terrific start for Kelly. In addition to this award, her searing short, Black Bodies, produced by an all-black female team, played at this year's prestigious Sundance Film Festival, one of only six Canadian productions to screen there. Set to a poem by Comey Olaf, Black Bodies uses a minimalist style to speak to the issues defined by the Black Lives Matter movement. And once the COVID lockdown ends, Kelly will resume shooting her next project in Jamaica, her first feature, When Morning Comes. This is a filmmaker with something to say, the skills to say it with ferocity, and the heart to do it with grace and empathy. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2021 winner of the J. Scott Prize, Kelly Fife Marshall. Peace and love, everybody. I want to thank the Toronto Film Critics Association for awarding me with the J. Scott Prize. I'm honored, honored to be a part of his legacy and to be added to the list of amazing emerging filmmakers. I promise to do my part to add to the landscape of Canadian film. Um, I'm, I know that I was also given this in part for my action and for my work within the Black Lives Matter movement. And so I really do urge everybody who's watching this to make ripples where you are. Make ripples within your family unit, within your school, within your workplace, your community, your friendship circles, to make this world, this place, a safer space for Black and Indigenous folk. And by making ripples, we'll soon turn into waves and we'll see the change that we all want to see. Thank you so much again. I'm honored. Well said, Kelly. Congratulations. The Clyde Gilmore Award is a career achievement honor, singling out someone in the community who has made a substantial contribution to the enrichment, understanding, and appreciation of Canadian filmmaking and Canadian cinema. This year's honoree is Jason Ryle. From 2010 until he stepped down last summer, Jason, whose background is Anishinaabe from Manitoba, was the executive director of the Imagine Native Film Festival. On his watch, Indigenous filmmakers, media artists, and the festival help shape and will continue to uplift not just the stature of Indigenous cinema, but also Canadian film for decades to come. Jason helped create the on-screen protocols and pathways which not only support Indigenous artists working in film and television, but provide guidance to any production involving First Nations participation. And that includes steering productions to truer and fuller representations of First Nations people on film. He was also active internationally as an advisor for Indigenous films at the Berlinale and the European film market. And it doesn't stop there. Jason is an independent producer with short and feature films, as well as a virtual reality series in development. He's also the chair of the Ontario Arts Council's Visual and Media Arts Committee, and is a member of the Indigenous Advisory for the National Film Board of Canada. Educator, thought leader, arts champion, story editor, producer, filmmaker. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2021 winner of the Clyde Gilmore Award, Jason Ryle. Thank you so much to the Toronto Film Critics Association uh, for this award. Uh, I found out earlier in the week and it's still something that I'm processing, um, but it's a beautiful thing to process during this time. Um, I feel like I wanna say so much, but also not entirely sure of what exactly to say. This is the first time I'm winning an award solo as an adult uh, and it's a really wonderful feeling, but um, I also can't tell you how unbelievably moved I am by your decision. Um, particularly when I look at the past recipients of this award, um, you know, and I'm, I'm honestly astounded that I, I'm standing beside them um, uh, on, on this roster. Uh, Tantu Cardinal, Alanisa Bomswin, Zach Canuck, uh, these people have been icons in our industry, role models to me, incredible friends who have given me support over the years in terms of my career. Uh, so to be recognized with them, um, with the same prize, uh, is, is both deeply humbling and incredibly, incredibly motivational. Uh, not to mention the likes of Deepa Mehta and Pierce Handling and, and Norman Jewison, uh, and of, cor of course, Clyde Gilmore uh, himself. Um, my career so far has been somewhat unexpected. Uh, I've had no real master plan in terms of the work that I've done, but I've always hoped that my work in some way has contributed positively to community. Um, the Indigenous community, of course, but also to our larger shared industry. Um, I've been very privileged uh, and happy to have been a part of Imaginative 
Um, and now that I've moved on, looking back is a little easier and, and I can see uh, more clearly the tremendous work and the impact that organization had. Uh, and it was an absolute privilege uh, to lead that organization and to be part of a period of time uh, where so much change happened in our sector. Um, you know, my life was changed by Imaginative, and one of the motivating factors of working there for so many years was that one could see uh, other people's lives being changed positively by the work of Indigenous screen storytellers. Um, and I know this award is an acknowledgement so much of Imaginative success, uh, which was a result of so many hands, hearts, and minds that I worked alongside. And I thank all those people from the bottom of my heart. Um, I also really want to thank my family. They're not always entirely sure what I do for, for work, um, but they know that I love what I do and, and I do. I really love, I really love what I do. Um, and I know my work and my passion has taken me away from my family, uh, but their love, their kindness uh, and support has always given me strength over the years. And I carry that strength and rely on that strength on a daily basis. So in that way, they've, they've always, always been with me and very close. Um, there's been so much change in our sector here in Canada, as you all know, uh, and there's so much more to come. There's so much building that needs to be done. There's so much work that needs to happen. And there are so many stories to tell. Uh, and this is a beautiful, exciting time for us in the industry. And I look forward to hearing many, many more stories by Indigenous filmmakers. Um, and to receive this award, in as much as it's an acknowledgement for past work, um, as I start the next chapters of, of my career as a producer, as an arts manager, uh, as a programmer, uh, this, award is all, this award is also really, really incredibly motivational. And in many ways, I feel like I am just getting started. So thank you again to the Toronto Film Critics Association. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations, Jason. On behalf of the TFCA, we are all looking forward to your next act. As the call for representation and inclusion gets louder in the film industry, the same should happen in film criticism. The voices of diverse critics must be amplified, just like the films and filmmakers who are sparking necessary conversations. TFCA Awards creative director R.T. Thorne had a chat with some of the filmmaking community's diverse voices to talk about the way the industry is changing, the powerful role of film journalism, and why point of view matters, both on screen and in print. I want to thank you all for, for joining us. How important do you think it is for, you know, the film journalism side of the industry to reflect the cultures of the artists that are creating some of this work? For certain in, in my community, you know, we want Indigenous stories coming from Indigenous people. The level of authenticity a person of color will bring to a story about people of color is much different than what a white person will bring to it. In that same way, journalists, if they're, looking, if they're looking at our work from their white perspective, there's going to be a whole bunch that they're missing. I think it's important to have a range of voices responding to film. It doesn't mean that any one voice is invalid. Mm -hmm. It just means that when all of the voices come from just one background or predominantly from one background, that's invalid. That doesn't work anymore. Never sh really should have, mm -hmm. but Definitely now. Coming from other cultures, we have a different way of telling stories. We don't necessarily have the Western hero uh, concept or maybe our acts are different. It's just so many nuances. Look at Lovecraft. I was thinking about Lovecraft and, um, and there was something, there's something so black about it. There are many protagonists, which I found that the way black folks like to tell stories, it tends to come from this multi-layer thing. Things like that, that historically, uh, if we looked at films, those things would never be uh, applauded. It would be like, that story's too confusing. Like it, it doesn't have a single narrative. Personally, when I look at critiques about my own work, it's almost like the film is important because of the content. And that is true. Like I do think I'm making work that the content is very important, but they pretty much don't talk at all about the filmmaking style that I have employed in my movie and very carefully thought about. And I made a film that was very stylistically distinct. Like you literally don't see the character's face <laughs> for the whole movie. It really does do me a disservice as a filmmaker because it makes it seem like 
oh, her work's only important because she's like a black woman and she's telling the story about black people and not, she's also a very talented filmmaker with a unique voice and perspective and style that is being brought to the table. We all want to believe that everybody can watch something and sort of glean from it what they think is important and, and the values of it. But there is a blind spot that we all have. People have diverse uh, cultural perspectives. Uh, we have, we have built-in gender biases and those biases feed into what we think is good, what resonates with us. And then therefore that comes along with your recommendation. When I was coming up as a film critic, like, you know, think about it, I've been doing this since 2007, 2008, and there was nobody else. And, 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 and what I do in my reviews and stuff, I uphold the white, like the, the white status. And I think that in some of my writing, you will see internalized racism and hatred, especially if you go back to those early articles where I'm trying to be the next, you know, Jeff Pivier or whatnot, and trying to, I'm trying to achieve this status of becoming the film critic of the Toronto Star. There's a very narrow, very, very narrow band of storytelling that I found that white critics uh, jump on board uh, automatically. Black work, doesn't get highlighted, doesn't get um, you know uh, promoted in the same way unless it fits that narrow band. I looked at what Sundance played that year. Pretty much all the films that were about Black people were poverty porn, trauma porn, or very explicitly about race and racism. If I was trying to be a commercial success, I would have looked at that and said, okay, well, I guess if other people are going to like and appreciate my work, it's going to have to be more explicitly about race or racism because that is what is being celebrated. To me, I feel as a viewer, often misrepresented, often the stories um, that are, are promoted as the important stories for queer narratives end up being about queerness and they're often um, wrought with tragedy or difficulty. Mm. That's not my queer experience. I think if you had more queer people writing about them, there would be a little bit more expressed attuneness to what's missing. Speaking of critics, what do they have to do to, uh, to help change this landscape? You know, when it comes to what voices do have that, that platform, whether it's a national newspaper or a, a TV program or a radio program or something like that, a podcast, it's important to share space, you know, to kind of open up space for others. And I like the fact that kind of some of the newspapers in this country, for instance, have opened up their pages to, to new voices, uh, particularly when there's a film where the, the existing full-time critic acknowledges that they may not have um, the kind of expertise to write about it and, and they might go out to a freelancer and that makes a difference um, to have someone like Sarah Ty Black in the pages of the Globe and Mail, you know, writing about uh, a black movie, for instance. Critics in Canada, film critics, do not like supporting filmmakers, especially filmmakers of color from Canada. You have to have proved yourself somewhere outside the country and then suddenly they'll wake up and they'll recognize you, you know? I'm going to say two very simple things, um, support and amplify each other. And critics out there and to the creators out there, you've got the black screen office is here now. So you've got a resource there. There's BIPOC TV and film, there is impact. There is the ISO. Um, we also support the LGBTQ community. So find us and let us tell you who those new voices are. Allow us to help amplify and support. We're here, we're not going anywhere. A big thank you to the black creators, industry leaders of color, and queer filmmakers who have given the industry a lot to think about. We appreciate your labor, and I hope the TFCA specifically takes those words to heart and makes tangible changes to the makeup of their membership. And now it's time for the biggest award of the night. The Rogers Best Canadian Film Award. Here are the three nominees. A wildfire all but destroys a Quebec town. A generation later, it's as if the entire community still suffers a strange combination of denial and PTSD. But from the ashes of trauma, two elderly people with lost lives find each other. And The Birds Rain Down, directed by Louise Archambault, is a sad and moving drama taken from Jocelyn Saussier's novel. In its celebration of communities that are too often invisible, it is a rare bird indeed. Our critics praised its sense of people and place that grows richer as the film unfolds and called it a unique, intimate portrayal of love among the aged and overlooked. Let's take a look at And the Birds Rain Down. Oh,
Bien, où est bonne? J'ai jamais appris à nager. Oh. Oui, pas okay, bon. Je dirais pas où vous habitez, hein? Promis. Je donne toi, es-tu pour le gouvernement, toi? Non, je suis photographe. Je cherche des gens qui ont survécu au grand feu de la région. Tout a brûlé. C'était un enfer. Avez-vous connu Boy Chuck? Bah, c'est une légende. Il a marché durant six jours sans s'arrêter. J'ai toujours été clair que je prendrais ma retraite dans le bois. Puis cette vie-là, je la vive à mon goût. Et maintenant, elle est à ton goût. Our next nominee is Anne at 13,000 feet. This third feature from Toronto writer-director Kazik Radwanski is an intimate and riveting cinema verite style study of a young woman slowly unraveling. The film is built around a stunning performance by last year's J. Scott Prize winner actress Dara Campbell, who is in every scene. Our critics called it electrifying, steadily building an intensity and an empathy and an absolute force of nature. One concluded, if there is justice in the Canadian film world, Anne at 13,000 Feet will be the film to launch both its director and star into the international stratosphere. Here's Anne at 13,000 Feet. You feel the lift off the ground, and you feel the plane climbing into the sky. What can I do for you? Because I think you're in trouble. You're, ups you're upset. No, Just, no. 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 Right. Do you need to go talk to somebody? And you're just hearing all this Russian air. You just hear. <laughs> and then they pull the parachute and it goes. At the beginning of our third nominated film, White Lie, we're not sure why Katie is faking a cancer diagnosis. We just know it's working. She's a celebrity on her university campus, living off crowdfunding campaigns. But when she's suddenly pressed to provide proof from a doctor, her story becomes both a heart-in-your-mouth race against time and a fascinating enigma. Why is she choosing to live this lie, and how far will she go? Writer-directors Yona Lewis and Calvin Thomas pull off a high-wire act, getting us to root for someone we may never understand. Our critics called it a character piece that plays like a thriller and a mystery that will have you leaning into the screen. One noted, Casey Rule's excellent lead performance sells every aspect of her character's desperate need for friends, love, and attention. Let's take a look at White Lie. Hey guys, uh, my name's Katie Arnson, if you don't already know that. Um, I'm in my second year of university, I'm studying contemporary dance. And on July 14th, I was diagnosed with melanoma, which is a scary word for skin cancer. Um, I start chemo in a few weeks, and so I'm, I'm posting this to uh, somewhat awkwardly ask for financial support. Yeah, okay. Hugs, good vibes. Um, I'm just gonna try and keep smiling. And love you guys. And now, it's my honor to introduce all of the nominees. Louise Archambault, Calvin Lewis, Yona Thomas, Kazik Radwanski, and the Vice Chairman of Rogers Communications, Inc., Mr. Phil Lind, to announce the winner of the Rogers Best Canadian Film Prize. Thank you, Kathleen. This is a great honor and a pleasure to present this award. Rogers, you know, has a proud history of providing support for the Canadian program production industry. Indeed, in our over 25 year history for the Rogers Telefund and the Rogers Group of Funds, we have given either loans or equity or grants, straight grants, totaling more than $600 million. This award tonight is continuation of this commitment. The outstanding Canadian film, as selected by the, Canadian, by the Toronto film critics, is, this is it here, we'll open it up. And we'll say, ah, 
and at 13,000 feet, directed by Kaz Radwanski. Wow, um, thank you so much. <clears throat> This is a tremendous honor. Um, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Rogers and the, the TFCA, the Toronto Film Critics Association. Um, yeah, this is uh, a tremendous honor. I first, I just want to congratulate Calvin, Yona, and Louise, uh, the fellow nominees. And yeah, this is this is uh, huge for us. Um, I'm so proud of my team and my and my crew of friends that made this film together. Uh, thank you to Dan Montgomery. Uh, he's been by my side for, for the past decade, uh, the two of us working together on these projects. Uh, Isla, Nikolai, Zoe, but of course, yeah, the cast, uh, Dara, this film would not be possible, would not be possible without Dara. Thank you for jumping out of a plane uh, with me. Um, thank you to Matt Johnson for, for, for joining us on this adventure, Dorothea, Lorene, thank you to Oliver, the shark boy. Um, yeah, we're just, uh, it's been a wild journey uh, this, this, this year, this pandemic, this COVID. Uh, thank you to Cameron Bailey and Andrea Picard for believing in the film and programming it at TIFF. And, and yeah, thank you to our team for, for sort of steering it through this pandemic, this sort of virtual year. Um, so yeah, thank you to, uh, uh, Chris and Nathan at Mo, uh, Film Modit, um, and to Tom and Peter at Cinema Guild, but also to our publicists, Michael Lieberman and Sam Chater. Um, it's been a wild ride and it just means so much to have the film still have a life and still connect and, and to be written about. I mean, this is a huge honor coming from the Toronto Film Critics Association. Um, you know, I'm a cinephile, or, or, we're, we're a group of, of movie lovers. We, we love watching movies and we uh, can't wait to be back into in, in a movie theater and for movies to be screening in, film, in theaters again and uh, for them to be written about. So uh, I hope to see you all in a movie theater again soon. But yeah, thank you so much. Um, such a huge honor. This is a lot of money for us. This is a third of our budget. This is gonna really help us uh, start working on the next project, uh, another project shot here in Toronto. So again, tremendous honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lind. And thank you, Kazakh Radwanski. We're thrilled for you and that's it for us. Thank you for tuning in. And a huge thanks to our sponsors, to Cineplex and to our lead sponsor, Rogers, for your support this year and for so many years. And to the beautiful Paradise Theatre. When theatres reopen in Toronto, please come see films here. And until we can all get back into theaters safely, rent or buy movies, support your filmmakers, and stay safe. Good night. Good night. <laughs>